When the summer sun begins to fade, the war eagle takes flight. The dog days of summer give way and the grove comes to life. The sounds of cowbells, hog calls, and roll tide fill the air. It's tradition, tailgating, and rivalries, and it all means one thing. It's football time in the SEC. From the Sinclair Broadcast Group, this is SEC Media Days 2017. It's like me saying somebody said it's going to have a hurricane outside today. Is that right or wrong? It's just, I just said it. No, no I didn't have anything to do with the homecoming <laughs> game against LSU. Do you have 21 starters returning? Uh, how important is that for the leadership of your team? 21 stars returning. Wow, that is a new one for me. You see Coach Mushan today, me and him got the same suit on, except mine's got blue stripes and his got red stripes. So I think I look better in it. You see how big his head is? <laughs> you ever seen the Flintstones gazoo? That Martian? What, like that? So. Welcome to the SEC Media Days 2017 Friday finale. The coach and players speak ended Thursday, but we're still talking tonight. And we thank you for listening to us and watching. I'm Jeff Spiegel from WBMA in Birmingham. And welcome into our studio here in Hoover, Alabama. I'm joined by on the far end of the desk, Corey Miller of WACH in Columbia, South Carolina, Dave Staley of WTVC in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and Kevin Skarbinski of AL.com and the Birmingham News. Good to see you guys. Here are the top three things on the agenda. Is Nick Saban killing the SEC? How much can Jarrett Stidham help turn the tide? And who's the most overrated team in the SEC? First thing first, who was the biggest winner this week, guys? Well, for me, it was kind of stale for the most part until yesterday, until Will Muschamp came into the house, and he was loose, he was funny, he didn't have any stress, he joked about his players, he joked with the media, and that's what it's all about. You can't get stressed out about media day. He came with the attitude, I'm going to have a good time, I'm going to enjoy the process, and for me, there was a level of confidence that came along with that. Yeah. I'm with you on that, although I'm going to go with Alabama. Nick Saban, you never go wrong with this guy, as we talked about yesterday. He's the gift that keeps on giving. Ultimately, in the end, he was a treat. He said all the right things. He knows the way this uh, plays out in the bottom line. I, I think his players did a nice job in front of the media. Uh, I give him a thumbs up. You talk about exuding confidence. I don't think anyone exuded more confidence than Gus Malzahn oh, of Auburn. True, yeah. Probably more than you should be allowed to demonstrate when you've been 11 <laughs> and 13 in the league <laughs> Probably. the last three years. He's the biggest winner right now. Right. We'll see if that translates in three months. Yeah. Well, it was a rather low-key media days. The only rant I heard came from Nick Saban debunking a quarterback controversy. He's part of tonight's first drive. We're not going to tolerate people making stuff up. All right, just to create interest, which I understand and respect that's your job, but just not going to happen. It was, that was like a hanging curveball. <laughs> so Jalen Hurts is number one, but Saban did say this about freshman Tua Tagovailoa, quote, we want to continue his development, and part of that development is he needs to play in games. So Kevin, when will Tua make his debut, a series or two against Florida State? or the next week against Fresno State. How about this? Before halftime of the Florida State game, wow. you'll see Tua Tungavaloa wow. in the game. And not necessarily because Jalen Hurts is struggling, but for that very reason. Nick Saban wants to get him meaningful snaps. So if the time comes when he has to play him, he's not shocked. Yeah, those would be meaningful Interesting. snaps. Mm. Dave Saban says he doesn't want his players to waste the failure that was that loss to Clemson. They're loaded and they're motivated. I guess what he means is you guys say he wants them to learn from that loss and understand what it takes to get over that next hump. Uh, there's a lot of humps they've gotten over over the years. Yeah. Bottom line, he says they want to continue to climb the mountain. That's the uh, avenue of success. I'm still not quite sold on what he means by that, uh, but uh, he knows better than we do, I guess. He's Corey. Nick Saban. Corey, the Tide has won three straight SEC titles, 17 straight league games. Saban has turned this into a one-team league. Has that hurt the league? I, I think so to a degree from a national perspective. Yeah. When people look at the SEC, that's why you hear all the chatter right now that it's not a good league because Alabama dominates it. But I agree with Nick Saban. Something he said, there is a lot of parity underneath Alabama. Alabama is the best team, but when you go from two through the rest, I think it's pretty even across the board, and I still think it's a great league. 
Dave? I think it's a great league, but I think to some degree it maybe hurts it, at least in the eyes of perception. But I'm not sure if you can uh, get on somebody's case because they're winning and winning. That's what you're supposed to do in college football. I mean, that's, that's the goal. Well, the SEC's rep as the best league from top to bottom has taken a serious hit. Yeah. Look at the ACC. Look at all those guys beating their chest this week yeah. at their media days. Yeah. Jimbo Fisher, the commissioner John Swafford, Dabo Sweeney, to a man. I think the last count, at least eight of them had declared the ACC the best league in college football. True. And at the moment, it probably is. Maybe. Ten, I disagree with that. That's we'll yeah. another day. Ten Alabama <laughs> players on the media's preseason all-SEC first team. That came out today. That's pretty impressive. Hey, the team that could break that title streak and keep the tide out of the playoff is Auburn. The Tigers have a gunslinger from Waco way at quarterback, a beast of a running back, NFL caliber talent on defense, and something else all great teams need. We're ready to play football. We've been getting after it. We have a chip on our shoulder because we haven't finished how we have wanted to the past couple of years. And, you know, we're, we're, we're ready to change that this year. All right, Jared Stidham is going to be the starter. I think everybody knows that. Does he have to be as good as advertised for Auburn to win the West? I think he has to be good, and I think he has to be smart with the football. We know he can throw the football, but he hasn't had a lot of starts, and there's a lot of hype, and I hate all the hype because, to me, it's like I'm Missouri. Show me. You know, don't <laughs> talk about it, but show me. I want Steve Spurrier to talk and see. It sounds great, but we'll see. He hasn't faced defensive fronts like he's going to face in the SEC. Can he handle the pressure? We just got to wait and see. I believe in this day and age, the toughest position to play in all of sports and maybe the most important to play in all of sports is quarterback. No matter what level you're at, uh, yeah, hitting a baseball and stopping a hockey puck are still right up there. But yes, he has to be as good as advertised. If not, big problem. Well, d let's look at Auburn's recent history. When they had Cam Newton, what did they do? They won a national mm -hmm. championship. When they had Nick Marshall the first year, what did they do? They got to the national mm -hmm. championship game. And Jarrett Stidham is not Cam Newton. He is not Nick Marshall. He's a very uh -huh. different kind of quarterback. Yes. But when they don't get excellent quarterback play in that offense, right. they struggle mightily. Right. Cam Petway ran for 1,224 yards last year, 1,045 of that in six games. Teammates say he's leaner and meaner than he was last year. Kevin, that's scary. Well, he's going to put up numbers. Gus Malzahn, even in, in mediocre seasons for Auburn, they run the ball and they run it well. The question is, what's the run-pass balance going to look like? Mm -hmm. That's what Gus Malzahn keeps telling us. This is Chip Lindsey's offense. He's retired his clipboard. Chip's going to call the plays. It's going to be more 50-50. I've got to see it to believe it with yeah, Gus I'm Malzahn as the head coach. Yeah. Best case scenario, worst case scenario for Auburn. Well, best case is obviously knock Alabama off and win the <laughs> SEC West and play for the SEC championship. That's the best case. But the worst case, what if they're not as good as advertised? What if Gus Malzahn is blowing smoke like he was yesterday, <laughs> in my opinion? Because at the end of the day, we need to talk about that defense as well. They lost some good pass rushes out there. Can they stop people from throwing the ball down the field? So, yeah, the offense could be good. Defense wins championships. Best case, I agree. Yeah, yep. beat Alabama, get to the uh, SEC uh, title game, maybe even win the SEC title. Worst case scenario, I go back to quarterback. He doesn't play well, Mr. Stidham, and it, it all goes that way. Yeah, the best way case, best case. Gus Malzahn was not blowing smoke when he played the 2010 and 2013 cards <laughs> in his media days address. And, of course, the worst case, they go to Clemson the second week. They struggle on offense. Gus Malzahn unretires his clipboard, and then you've got a tug of war between him and Chip Lindsey, between Sean Ooh. White and Jarrett Stidham, and we see a repeat of last year. Good point. Ooh. One of my favorite players this week was LSU's Darius Geis. Geis wore a bow tie with a pink sport coat, and he didn't need a fashion consultant to tell him it looked good. Uh, the style for today, um, when I was going, you know, to try on suits and stuff, I just saw this on a mannequin, and I was like, that'll look way better on me for Monday. So I just, you know, took this off the mannequin, the whole attire, and just put it on me. And I was like, I'm going with this. All right, very quickly, was Darius Geist the star athlete of the week? I, I think so, but I got a 1B with the Missouri linebacker calling out Arkansas and everybody else. But I like his confidence. I like that he said, I'll play anyone on the football field. I will hit folk. I'll knock your head off. Man, I love that mentality. Yeah, I think so. I like the way he dressed. We talked about that earlier. Nice way to go. But I like the confidence. I always like that in a young football player. Yeah, I'll go with that. I've got to object on one point, though. He said the Alabama defense was scared yeah. of LSU's running game well, because uh, they stacked the box. No, they stacked yeah. the box because they weren't scared mm. of LSU's passing game. <laughs> That's exactly <laughs> right. True. Right. Still to come on SEC Media Days 2017, who was the biggest loser this week? Also coming up, the natives are restless in Athens. Is Georgia the most overrated team in the SEC? To kick off 2017. 
most MU fans are. Oh, I don't know. Respect is earned, and, and uh, obviously we're not very good. So that's all right. We'll, we'll show up. Florida coach Jim McElwain downright surly after about Georgia getting more love in the East than his two-time defending uh, champs are getting. Kevin, I get it. He's an offensive coach, and they've been bad on offense. Nothing Malik Zaire can't fix. Well, I think he's concerned about his offense, and he should be. But I think what really bothered them was he had to leave his Montana cabin in the second week of <laughs> July and come answer a bunch of dumb questions like it, f bogus Internet pictures of sharks. Yeah. Uh, I think that, that really got under his skin. Right. Probably. Yeah, Dave, Florida yeah. plays LSU for homecoming. Max said, look, I don't control scheduling. Nick Saban may, but I don't. Do you believe him? I don't believe it at all uh, with respect to coach. I mean, are you telling me that he – doesn't talk to the athletic director. They don't get together and uh, chew the fat, so to speak. Am I missing something here? <laughs> of course. Of course he knew it was going to yeah, happen. I think so. Uh, Corey, he says this. we're making too big a deal out of this homecoming stuff. You play college football at South Carolina. Is it a big deal to a player when a team yeah. schedules your team for homecoming? Yes, it's a lack <laughs> of, of respect, actually. You know, you schedule a team for homecoming that you supposedly can beat when easy, the backups get to play, you get to smile and wave at the people in the stands and have a good time. Well, that's not going to be the case with Florida and LSU because they're feeling really disrespected. And I don't know if he knew or he didn't know, but he's going to know come homecoming game because those Tigers are going to be fired up. Yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun. Kirby Smart is just entering his second year at Georgia, but he's been there long enough to get a handle on the expectations. Smart and the Bulldogs came to Hoover with the same old expectations, but back-to-back single-digit win seasons have Bulldogs fans feeling a little bit antsy. In the last 10 years, five single-digit win seasons. Kevin, is Georgia overrated? I don't think they're underrated or overrated this year. I think they are the most underachieving program in the SEC over the last decade. It is astounding that that program has not won an SEC title since 2005. Wow. With the talent they recruit year in and year out. And look, they didn't fire Mark Richt and hire Kirby Smart to go 8-5. and five. Mm -hmm. He needs to step it up this year. Corey, the defense yeah. is going to be good, maybe great. Uh, the question is the offense. Mm -hmm. 102nd in the FBS in scoring last year. Yeah, it was bad in the quarterback play. You got a big five star. He looked bad, but it was because of the offensive line. You got to protect the quarterback. You got to keep him upright. But they got Nick Chubbs. They got Sonny Michelle. They got a more experienced offensive line that can pound the football. Yeah. Kirby Smart needs to play to the way he knows the play, similar to what Alabama does pound the football, protect safe throws for the quarterback. And I think they can win the SECs. I like this Georgia football team. Dave, you're in Chattanooga. You're, you're yeah. in that market that covers both the Bulldogs and the Ooh. Tennessee yes, Volunteers. Sir. If the East is a three-team race, will that third team be Tennessee or Kentucky or South Carolina? I'm going with Kentucky. We'll probably talk about it later in the show, simply because maybe, maybe out of default, simply because of the fact I'm not quite sold on the Volunteers this year, not quite sold on South Carolina, not sold on Vandy or, or Mizzou. Uh, I think Kentucky under Stoops has a shot to get in there at number three. Guys, can Tennessee, Kentucky, or South Carolina for three? You're going South Carolina. I, I, think it's, I mean, I think it's up for grabs, and then those teams are obviously going to play each other, but I think they're going to battle for that third-place position. But I like South Carolina. I like the quarterback. I like the high-powered offense, and I like Will Muschamp. Why? Because he has the ability to coach up a defense. Even when they're lacking in the area, that defensive line will be much better this year. I'm taking South Carolina. I'm with Corey. Yeah. I think there's a drop-off from Florida and Georgia mm -hmm. to the rest of the Absolutely. East. Absolutely. But I love Jake Bentley. All right, guys, we're going to take a break right here. We're going to check in with our Sinclair station, KRCG. And if you ever want to know how tough a job Barry Odom has in Columbia, this story will give you a clue. In less than nine weeks, Mizzou football will return to Faro Field to kick off 2017. Most MU fans are counting down the days to a different Tiger season. Definitely more excited about basketball. Um, landing the several huge recruits is going to help out a lot. Me and my buddy over here, we're going to buy season tickets. I don't even care. Quanto Martin, Michael Porter, let's do this. Missouri basketball. Boasting one of the nation's top recruiting classes, which includes number one overall recruit and Columbia native Michael Porter Jr., Mizzou basketball has been the talk of the town, even with football season less than two months away. 
Taylor Dillard works at Tiger Spirit in downtown Columbia. Everyone's wanting jerseys this year, which we haven't really had much requests for in the past. We just got in a couple new Mizzou basketball shirts. The expectations aren't quite as high for Mizzou football this season. The Tigers are looking for improvement both in the win column and in the stands. Last year, Missouri averaged just over 52,000 fans per game here at Faro Field. That was down from an average of 65,000 the year before. On the field, the Tigers went just 4-8 and eight a season ago. They missed out on a bowl game for the second consecutive year. Missouri hadn't missed the postseason in back-to-back -back years since a four-season stretch from 1999 through 2002. But Tiger fans are optimistic that the Tigers can get back in the bowl picture in 2017. That's what I'd like. I'd like to support it team that does well. There's always excitement coming up in the fall. Um, we've got some new recruits. I think with a more experienced quarterback, we should have a better season this year. Tony Mullen reporting, and thank you very much on that. Guys, Missouri, well, what a job Barry Odom has in front of him. Four yeah. wins last year. The athletic director came out and said six wins would be progress, Kevin. That's kind of troubling, isn't it? Well, what's not troubling is their offense. Uh, they moved yeah. the ball last yeah. year. They put up a lot of <laughs> points. What is troubling is your head coach is a defensive guy. Yeah. That's where they really got to step yeah. up. Yeah, six wins. Again, we've talked about this. I'm not, I, I, I don't doesn't <laughs> instill a whole lot of confidence in no. the players. Ultimately, in the end, old Big 8 school, yeah, basketball is extremely important at Mizzou. I can understand that. A really, really good dynamic offense. Oh. Locke, one of the best quarterbacks in the SEC. You got a thousand yard rush at running back. You got a thousand yard receiver. That's not the problem. You're averaging 500 yards per game, but you got to stop people. You do. And this, this Missouri team had great defenses when they won the East. Look at all those defensive linemen and linebackers are playing right now in the National Football League. They got to get back to what works. There's only one other Power Five team that returns a 3,000 yard passer a 1,000-yard rusher, mm -hmm. and a 1,000-yard receiver. You know who that is? No, I, I do didn't. not. Oklahoma State. Oh, and that's, wow. uh, that's pretty impressive. Yeah, they can throw it and catch it. They run can it. run it, but they can't stop people. Yeah, so, problem. yeah. <laughs> up next, the guys weigh in on who was the biggest loser of the week at Media Days. And also coming up, this season, the get-back coach will be more important than ever. The rule that's got coaches a little nervous. Appreciate um, my sixth straight rousing round of applause when I get up here. You guys have fired up the last of the day, so let's get rolling. All right, thank you. I appreciate it. Poor Kevin Sumlin. No respect from the media Wednesday, and not much respect for Ole Miss coach Hugh Freeze either, who spent 16 minutes rambling in the big room before taking questions. I thought he was going to start reading from the Ole Miss media guide. The freeze filibuster, intentional or unintentional? Intentional. He knows what he's doing. He wanted to control the message. Yep. Intentional. He wanted control. I understand where he's coming from. Intentional, scripted, and vetted by his attorney <laughs> beforehand, <laughs> probably. Who yeah. is the biggest loser this week, Sumlin or Freeze? Uh, freeze. I, I mean, I understand why he did what he did. Like I said, it was intentional. But this program is in a bad position, and he is to blame and take the blame and, and move on with it. So, freeze. I say Sumlin, Texas A&M, pretty rich. They got a lot of bucks in Aggieland, and the pressure is on. And uh, we talked about this before. He looked somewhat defensive, almost defiant, did not look comfortable. Uh, I don't think it went well for him. I think it's got to be freeze. That Houston Nut lawsuit was a direct frontal assault on his character. Yeah. Yeah. It is the year of the quarterback in the SEC and the year of the young QB. Jalen Hurts, reigning offensive player of the year at Alabama. Jared Stidham, ready to rock and fire at Auburn. Jacob Eason at Georgia. Jake Bentley, voted co-MVP at South Carolina as a freshman last season. Shea Patterson came on strong late in his freshman year. Okay, so you're starting a team from scratch. Which one of these guys do you want? I'm going to cheat right here because if I'm starting a team and I'm running an offense with the dual threat guy, you know who I'm going with. That's going to be Hurts from Alabama. I'm taking that guy that can run it and pass. But I'm going pro-style offense, a guy that's in the film room, studies, understands the game. I am going Jake Bentley of South Carolina. If we're talking college, I indeed go with Jalen Hurts. I agree. Two-way player, he did it all, and he showed what he can do last year. If we're starting a professional team with the pro-style offense, I go with Eason. A lot of folks compare him to Matthew Stafford. That's a very nice comparison now, looking at Stafford's career with the Lions. He hasn't had much help. But uh, if we're going that way, I'm going with Mr. Eason. 
Well, Jalen Hurts has the best track record so far. Sure. He led his team into sure. the lead in the mm-hmm. national championship sure. game with two minutes left. But you know what they say, Jeff, big head, big brain. Yeah. So how do you go against Jake Bentley? That's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah. There is a new rule in the SEC. If you're a coach and you go out on the field to argue a call, you're getting a 15-yard penalty. Nick Saban and Will Muschamp, you better behave. Who gets flagged first, Saban or Muschamp? Wow. <laughs> I, I mean, you know, I, I cover South Carolina. I'm a fan of Alabama because of my son. Both coaches are fiery. I'm going to say Coach Saban gets it first. Yeah. I believe Muschamp. Okay. I'm not sure why. I have, <laughs> no, I have I know nothing, why. <laughs> nothing to back that up except to say uh, just previous history, looking at the way these gentlemen operate on the sidelines, I'm going to go with Muschamp. I hear from hundreds and hundreds of Auburn fans every day, and they're going to tell you they're not going to throw that first flag on Nick Saban. <laughs> they're going to make an example of someone else uh, yeah. like a Will Muschamp. Yeah. And, and uh, heaven forbid for Nick Saban to get ejected from a game. Can you imagine oh, the uproar, no. especially of having to Brian Denny? No. The Winfrey Hotel was full of Auburn fans Thursday. Meet Tiger Jake, a Maltese belonging to Rob Sanford. He's dyed Tiger Jake's hair to look like a tiger. Don't worry, no animals were harmed in this dying treatment. Tiger Jake, cute or a little creepy? <laughs> hey, I was walking in the hallway on Radio Row. And I saw this guy, and I saw this, what I we know now is a dog. I'm like, what is that? And who did this to this poor dog? Yeah. Oh. Creepy. You know, I think every TV station in the Southeast did a story on Jake. He yeah. was probably more popular yesterday than anybody. Uh, Alley at Large, a great, great story. Uh, I, I think it was cute. Yeah. I'm okay with it. Yep. The dog is cute. The dye job is creepy. (laughs) (laughs) Coming up, it is time to put the experts to work. And Corey, Dave, and Kevin weigh in on who's going to wind up in Atlanta in December to play for the championship. All right, the time has come. Who's going to be the big winners this year? Let's hear from the experts, starting with Corey. Well, the SEC title game is going to come to another team that's very familiar for the fourth in a row. I'm going with the Alabama Crimson Tide, no doubt about it, winning the West. Behind them is going to be, ah, I went hard with this, but look at these, Georgia, Florida, South Carolina is my third. I told you that earlier in the West. Alabama, LSU, and Auburn, guys. Alabama will win it all again four years in a row. My poor son. I'm so mad at him. He got all kind of rings and bling. Daddy has nothing, but he'll get his fourth SEC championship this year. Yeah, Corey's son, Christian, plays for the Alabama Crimson Tide. Great linebacker. Look for big things from him this year. Dave? Jeff, I, too, have the uh, Tide and Dogs in the SEC title tilt in the East. Going to be Georgia, Florida. I've got Kentucky coming in third. Not super sold on that, but I'll go with the Cats. In the West, Alabama wins again. No surprise. Auburn a close second. LSU third. Not quite sold on LSU as well. Ed Orgeron, we'll see. Of course, I have the Tide winning another title. All right, Kevin? If you don't pick Alabama, you're just taking a shot in the dark. Yeah. Alabama is going to be in Atlanta again, but the Iron Bowl is going to be the SEC West Championship game. And they're going to meet Georgia and Kirby Smart. We're going to have another mentor, protege championship game, and the boss is going to get the better of the student. Uh, By the way, the media voted Alabama to win the West, Georgia to win the East, the Tide to win the title. The media has only been right six times in the last 25 years. That says something. That's not a great percentage, but they have picked the champion right two of the last three years. Mm -hmm. It's been kind of easy. Right? So we're on a roll. Well, yeah, they'll, yeah. Be, they'll be yeah. right this year. For Corey, Dave, right. and Kevin, yeah. I'm Jeff Spiegel. <laughs> Have a great night, everybody, and enjoy this football season.